So I'm now at the Strengthening Disability Advocacy Conference with Lauren Henley, who's just chaired a session here or facilitated a session. Um, but Lauren, can you just talk us through your background as, a, as an advocate and as a policy person? Sure. I started off working in the disability sector oh, about eight years ago, I think. So I was working for Blind Citizens Australia at the time. I'm also totally blind. I lost my sight in a car accident when I was 20. So that was 10 years ago. Um, from there, I moved into the role of National Policy Officer with Blind Citizens Australia and I have been working at the Australian Human Rights Commission for the last few years. Also had the opportunity to work as advisor to the Disability Discrimination Commissioner and I've just started a couple of weeks ago in the role of Policy and Research Officer with the Youth Disability Advocacy Service here in Victoria. Which is quite famous here in Victoria. Absolutely. It's a very strong yeah. one. Um, now you just, as I said, facilitated that session and it was quite quite a high profile pa a group of panel sure it was. was it had deborah glass a victorian ombudsman and it had a state labor member marie edwards who's been in, very much involved in the inquiries here uh and patsy frawley um from deakin university who does a lot of work around anrose and i just realized i haven't got the name of the fourth person therese sands therese that's yeah. right she wasn't on the program no she's, um, she stepped in at the last minute from uh, Trevor Carroll, who mm. works for Disability Justice Advocacy. So Therese Sands works for DPO Australia, or what was called the Australian Cross Disability Alliance, and she's just come over to that role for pe from People with Disability Australia. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, and you led it with great skill. Oh, thank you. <laughs> what did you think were the main points? Because it was a, it, there were some very serious issues ranging yeah, through, through from current inquiries through to the mm. need for a Royal Commission. What, what, what are your takeaways from uh, Look, there are so many points that are important to talk about. I think one of the main things was the need for a an overarching body for statutory oversight of disability abuse reporting and that needs to happen at a national level so it can't be different in every state and territory. We've got the NDIS rolling out now but we still don't have a national quality and safeguards framework. We're told that that will happen once the NDIS has been fully rolled out but in the meantime there's still all these gaps. So we really need to make sure that the advocacy sector feeds into what that framework is going to look like and make sure that it is robust and it does everything it promises to do. I think the other thing that Therese Sands spoke about was the need for a Royal Commission into disability abuse. And it's recognising that yes, people with disability have had the opportunity to feed into uh, the Royal Commission into institutional responses to child sexual abuse, for example, and a few of the other Royal Commissions that have been going on but there is no specific Royal Commission that is exclusively looking at disability. And Therese spoke about the fact that there's a Royal Commission into banking at the moment. Now, why is it that banking is given higher priority than the needs and interests of people with disability who are facing violence, abuse and neglect? It's absolutely ridiculous. There was also that problem about that actually trying to get um, disability onto the agenda of mm. those inquiries and indeed to other things where we're seeing with family violence, for yes. example, which is fantastic that it now has a much higher national profile, mm. but that it's still that people with disability are still struggling to get there. But there are also yes. some particular issues that were talked about in terms of residential care. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about the fact that family violence, you know, that particular sector, it doesn't really look at disability issues. It it's across the board. I've been doing training, uh, human rights training recently with New South Wales public servants. And you go in and they say, oh, look, I don't really work in disability. I don't think this is going to be relevant. But the whole thing is we're trying to get disability on the mainstream agenda. It doesn't matter where you're working. If you work in justice, if you work for police, and someone with disability comes into your service and says, I'm being abused, I'm facing domestic violence, or whatever their language happens to be, they are treated like anyone else and their disability needs need to be accommodated in that process. You don't just put them over in the corner and say they have a disability, they need to be dealt with by that sector. Can you talk about those issues in the residential centres that are particular around, you know, it was that it's often seen as a service incident. Um, what, yeah. are, what are the issues there? Well, I don't think people fully recognise the criminal elements of it when people with disability are involved and when it's sort of locked behind closed doors in institutions, for example, it's a service incident, it's, it's you know, complained about in terms of the internal complaints processes within that service and it's not looked at as a crime and it is a crime. Hum people's human rights are being violated and it's just not seen that way.
there's a whole um, thing around the language too that came up. But what, what were the other takeaways for you from the session? Perhaps if we can, and I probably jumped ahead, but if you yeah, could right. talk about, you know, what, what stood out for you. I think in terms of advocacy, and this was another point that Therese made, a lot of advocacy service the services are very responsive and very reactive and so they're very good at addressing problems as they arise and they've already been identified to the service but some of the situations where people's human rights are being so terribly violated are in settings where people don't necessarily have the capacity or the ability to call someone up and say hey I'm being abused they don't necessarily have a framework for abuse or language for abuse and they haven't necessarily been educated around their rights so advocacy needs to be looking at more of an outreach sort of service and going out into these places where people's liberty is deprived and identifying instances of abuse where they're occurring. But Therese also spoke about there being limitations in terms of service providers not letting advocates into those settings. So that's an ongoing issue and it's one we're still fighting. And what of the role of the NDIS in this? Where does, where does that take us? Uh, um, Deborah Glass, the Ombudsman, talked about how it's, um, it's actually probably messed up the waters a bit for her in that she was starting to do some investigations and now stuff slips off nationally. Yeah. Where else are the, are the issues? Are, are there opportunities as well as problems? Oh, look, there's definitely opportunities. I think what we need to recognise is that the NDIS is the biggest reform this country has seen since Medicare. So it's very new. There were always going to be teething problems. There were always going to be concerns. And it's about making sure that those are adequately responded to in an appropriate time frame. I think the, the really concerning issue, though, is you should always have a safeguards framework in place before you roll something out. And there's still so many gaps that have been that haven't been addressed. And the thing that didn't come up in this session that is of concern to me, because I've been working specifically with older people with disability who fall outside the NDIS, this NDIS quality and safeguards framework that we will have in a few years' time only applies to NDIS participants. If you acquire a disability after age 65, or you're 65 or over, when the NDIS hits your area, you're not eligible. So that framework will not apply to those people, and that is a major concern to me. That's an interesting thing as you've gone into YDAS. I know. <laughs> the two, two ends of the spectrum. Yeah, what, what are your main concerns, therefore, at the, at the other end? What, what will be your sort of policy priorities yeah. now? Look, my main concern with the older people, you mean? Uh, with younger people. With younger people. Mm. Oh, look, there's so many. And we were just talking, I had a meeting with the Auditor General's office last week in Victoria, talking about diverting youth from the criminal justice system. Mm. And there's an issue coming up there with NDIS because under the NDIS rules, if you're being held in custody, the NDIA is not responsible for your care and support needs, the department is. And so therefore, no one's taken responsibility yet of when that young person's coming out of custody, linking them back up with the NDIA, making sure they get the care and support they need. And so there's potentially you know, a three to nine month wait between when they get out of custody and when they're getting their care and support needs met. And you just end up with this cycle of reoffending because people are falling through the cracks. We already had raised in that panel the, the intersection with the Dondale um, mm. uh, abuses. That, that also, that's an issue of disability for, yeah. for many young people. Yeah, and it, it also raises the question of the intersectionality that exists between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and disability. It's such a huge crossover and the prevalence of disability is so much higher in Indigenous communities. And I think we really need to be a lot more mindful of that in our policy responses as well. One last question, if I may, and it would, um, it's about the logistics to um, be able to facilitate a, a setting <laughs> like that without sight. Sure. How do you manage it? Yeah, look, I uh, a lot of planning, I think. So I engaged quite a lot with my panellists in advance. They knew the general questions I was going to be asking in advance so they could think about how they wanted to respond to those. Uh, but because I can't read notes in the traditional sense, I use a, well, it's a braille note taker, but I'm not that fluent at reading braille to be able to do a, a session like that because I lost my sight later and learnt braille later. So I was doing it all from audio and just going line by line and reading it back as if I was hearing it in my ear. And you've been here all day? No, I haven't. I was doing some life admin this morning, so unfortunately I didn't make this well, morning session. Well, I've made you reflect completely on your session, so I won't make you do the whole conference. No, thing, but thank you very much, Lauren. Thanks Fantastic for the opportunity.